Welcome to the Rational Response Squad. I am Brian Sapient. I am Rick Hawkins. I'm Yellow Number Five. And I'm Razor. And we are the, the Rational, Rational Response, Response Squad. Squad. Response Squad. Response Squad. Response Squad. Response Squad. It's nice to have you guys with us today. Thanks for joining us once again on another episode of the Rational Response Squad. We want to start off here with a little mailbag piece. This actually is a question for Sam Harris. We're going to have Sam Harris on the show in an upcoming episode. And we thought it was a really good question to, to, to kind of answer right here today. Uh, and the question is, if we were to undermine religion, would civilization be able to uphold moral obligation or would it fold in on itself and thus make it necessary to invent another god? Personally, I don't think that things would change all that much if we were to uh, wipe away religion. I think we treat each other as we treat each other in spite of religion, not because of it. And the social and biological underpinnings of that, uh, I think, are pretty evident. We believe that through religion that we're all related in the story of Adam and Eve. And I think that that's in part why people, you know, they say, well, you're my brother, you're my, you know, you're my brother and sister. And, and, and that, in a way, is why we respect other people or try to have a genuine respect for other people of course when you look at religion you don't always see that respect that you would you know think that we should have where we have one you know civilization killing off another or you know wars being fought or just fights on the school playground so i mean we don't live in a perfect society right now with religion you know so it's not like you know reducing it would all of a sudden you know make us uh less perfect i mean we already are less perfect but um you know i think that you know through a scientific understanding, we can replace some of the archaic myth that, you know, we think we're all related, you know, because of Adam and Eve with the truth of the matter, which is that if and the truth is that we are all related. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if I get into a room in a, in a DNA testing lab with any one of our listeners right now, they can link our mitochondrial DNA together and show us where there's been a common link in our ancestry. And, and the fact that we are all related on on earth as far as all dna testing has provided to date so there's a reason right there to care about your neighbor you know obviously i mean you don't have to get along with everybody but you do have to have an understanding that you know yeah there's a link there you know we're related and uh and that same link is what religion will obviously say oftentimes is, is why you need to care about other people and respect other people are you guys trying to suggest that you don't think there'd be much of a change if we lost religion well i i think no, like society's not going to, you know, fundamentally change. I mean, there's still going to be war. There's still going to be disagreements between people. I think by ridding the world of religion, we'll simply have one less thing that we disagree upon. And that causes fighting and, and uh, you know, prejudices and things like that. Uh, but no, I don't think getting rid of religion is going to, to fix all the ills of the world. But I do think it will certainly make it a better place and give us uh, more of a common ground to stand upon. Well, one thing's certain, you know, with the end of religion, we won't have wars fought in the name of religion. So Exactly. Have you guys ever seen the movie Contact? Yeah. I right. read the book, actually. The, the book is better than the movie, but yeah, go on. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the most curious points that I, I saw in the movie that relates to this is uh, when the, the doctor, the main character, uh, she's in front of the committee and uh, they're talking to her. and. Uh, her lover, who's also on the committee, asked her, um, you know, do you believe in God? And her her answer to that was, I don't think the question is relevant. And I think that that's a very good point. The question isn't relevant. If you're the most qualified, your beliefs or politics, for that matter, are regardless, you know, like they shouldn't even be considered. You notice they never asked her if she was a Democrat or Republican, but it was certainly asked her if she believed in God. And, uh, you know, they told her that the relevance was that 95% of the population believes in a god an appeal to popularity exactly and that uh, in order to have somebody who represents the entire world they suggested that it be somebody who actually has a belief in some higher power right and to me that just blew my mind because if you're going to talk to an alien race or any race for that matter or any, any anybody in particular i mean uh you know what does it matter what your opinions are as long as, you know, you're benign and you're trying, you know, if you're most qualified. And, and in the same aspect, you know, a world without religion, there wouldn't be a need to ask that question. There wouldn't be a need to to wonder if that person next to you is a Buddhist or a Muslim or, you know, uh, any, any sort of theist in general or an atheist for that matter. And, uh, you know, Amanda Bloom put it succinctly when she said, uh, you know, atheists are actually fighting for a world without atheism because what we're actually seeking is a world where any sort of theism, anti or otherwise, is non-existent. 
Well, Rook, a lot of religious people like to uh, disconnect the human race from the animal kingdom. And in a way, we are. I mean, we should be better. Right. But a lot of people don't think that, you know, don't act that way. I mean, we're smarter than the, the lion, the, the elephant. The, we should treat each other with more respect. We actually heard Todd Friel uh, use this argument with the infidel guy just yesterday in debate. And, you know, the question was, well, are, are we better than all other species on Earth or are we equal to them? And it's like, well, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about intelligence or are you talking about like fighting ability? You know, because like Reggie said, you know, Cujo would probably kick his ass. You need dumb chuck <laughs> you know? skills. So, and I mean, he's not, he's not better than no, Cujo I mean, in that sense. No, you we know? are but, equal in a way. I mean, yeah, we're all made of the well, same. we're all just we're all made of the same. Yeah, we're, we're all made all of the same life. stuff. And yeah. But, uh, well, on that other point that we were making earlier, if you go back far enough, everything on Earth is a very, very distant cousin of everything else on Earth. Absolutely. You exactly. Right. So, right. Which is actually a good argument to, res- you know, respect the environment, to not try to degrade, uh, you know, the environment. And and you see that out of uh, out of the religious right, you know, often it's 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 an argument that um, people will disagree with me on. But I mean, I do think that there is a direct correlation to folks who believe that the end of the world is coming or that, you know, they don't really need to care too much about the future of Earth because, uh, you know, they're going to like an eternal uh, blissful existence. So, you know, they you know just basically disrespect the earth or life around them you know and yeah and we see the destruction of the environment in many ways and there's not much sense planning for the future when jesus is coming back and gonna rapture us all in the next 50 years right Right. you see the type of greed you know and corruption out of you know our current government right now in terms of you know giving the oil industry all sorts of beneficial uh legislation like for example first order of business when george bush uh jumps in the white house is removing himself from the kyoto protocol which is kind of standard you know like environmental uh laws that the rest of the world pretty much all agrees on every major industrialized nation uh, has signed the Kyoto Protocol. The only one to not be involved is the United States. And that was a direct George Bush decision. Right. I'm not so sure how much that has to do with his faith is (laughs) of just, uh, you know, cronyism as well. Well, so, yeah, cronyism, yeah. but let me make my theism correlation, would you? <laughs> <laughs> please do, please do. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and I get heat for that. I mean, people say that's a stretch, and I know it's a stretch, but at the same time, you know, um, I, 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 you know, and you're right. I mean, corruption and greed really have a, a lot more to do with it. They really do. Well, but, let's, let's, let's ask ourselves this question. I think it's important. Back to the, you know, civilization, if you can survive. Religion didn't patent the idea of goodwill and charity. It didn't patent the idea of conscious. Okay, these things existed long before religion came to be, and those just long after that it you know passes. Dan Barker actually wrote an article for goodness sake, and it's if atheists can have some sort of morality. I think he makes a good point when he talks about if we all became non-believers, if we all became atheists, and we live in a secular world, okay, we wouldn't suffer from you know fatalism. You know, whatever happens is God's will. Pessimism, we deserve to suffer. Salvation, death is not the end. Retribution. Justice will prevail in the afterlife. Magic, pray for help. We won't have holy wars, you know, kill for God. And we don't have to worry about, you know, some eternal forgiveness that I won't be held responsible for my mistakes now, but later. Uh, Or glory, suffering for Christ is an honor. These Christian sort of ideas, but they're also very religious and and see traits of them in other religions as well. We wouldn't suffer from those sorts of uh, confusing ideals. We won't have to worry about being poor is a good thing because Christ was poor. You know, we'll all all be looking for the betterment of ourselves and for society. So I think society would change for very drastically because we wouldn't have these, you know, fatalistic ideas. By the way, for those of you out there who want to read uh, more of Dan Barker, Dan Barker is a, uh, a famous uh, author who wrote a book uh, from, uh, was it Preacher to Atheist, I believe? Losing Faith and Faith. Losing Faith and Faith, right, from Preacher to Atheist. And uh, he is now the co-founder of Freedom from Religion Foundation. You can go to www.ffrf.org and uh, do a search for For Goodness Sake by Dan Barker and read that whole article that Rook was uh, referring to. And in fact, you can go and purchase one of our older shows. We have uh, a member of the Free Freedom from Religion Foundation. Right. Uh, Dr. Annie Laurie Gaylor, who was uh, the co-founder of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, uh, appeared recently and I believe in uh, show 14. So, yeah, boycott uh, South Dakota. Speaking of boycotting South Dakota and the fact that they are, uh, you know, trying to ban abortion right now. So, you know, you, know, you can also get Dan Barker's book on evolvefish.com. <laughs> I've been getting a bunch of requests in uh, email when I'm, when I'm handling some of the uh, Rational Response Squad email. Uh, people asking for like, how can I buy a t-shirt? And um, I want a hoodie. 
Yeah, I want a hoodie too, dude. All right. Um, but, you know, we're like, our deal is ending theism, ending irrational thought. And I'm not a t-shirt guy. I mean, that's why I've got, you know, Double Doe helping us out and, and, and making some t-shirts for us. If you go right, to right. doubledoe.com, it's uh, doh.com, you can uh, check out uh, our War on Easter and uh, coming up War on Christmas uh, t-shirts. We're not going to call it the War on Christmas, though. No, it's going to be the War on Christmas. No, no. I thought it was going to be the Enlightenment. The perpetual Enlightenment is the year-round uh, uh, activities that we're still working on right now. Gotcha. Good to um, clarify. Yeah, but but there will be a War on Easter and a War on Christmas because Bill O'Reilly wants it to be. So oh, that's true. So Bill O'Reilly's got his you know, war. I want to play right, right into his hands. Yeah. I want Bill O'Reilly to personally single me out and call me an asshole. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I want him to tell us to shut up. Shut up! Exactly. Yeah. Rational response squad, shut up. Shut up! I want, I want yes, him to tell exactly. <laughs> I want to have him tell people to run from me. <laughs> when you encounter a person like this in your life, ladies and gentlemen, run. Yeah. If you guys don't like Christmas and the fact that everybody in America celebrates this holiday, run. well, then you can shut up. Shut up! Run as fast. If you, if you find someone who thinks like them, run. Run. <laughs> you might have noticed we've got a new rational responder with us. If you've heard the show a few times, you know that my uh, expertise is uh, the areas of philosophy and uh, Rooks is uh, anything biblical. And yeah. ancient, ancient text. Keep doing that. <laughs> Gotta add that in. <laughs> He's not a one-dimensional guy. And, on. and, and neither of any of us. So you're trying, to, anyway. you're trying to pigeonhole them. I mean, come on. Well, but we need our titles to put on our badges, okay? <laughs> right? Just say ancient well, just text. Make, that encompasses just make the his Bible. badge really big. <laughs> ancient text incorporates the Bible, okay? So, and, and, text. And, and, of course, Mike is our scientific expert. And now Razorcade is our rational inquisitor. <laughs> Razor comes up with some of the best questions that none of us could come up with. I, I don't know how we does it he's got some kick-ass questions so he's gonna be great for the show because uh he'll pull some stuff out of our guests that uh that none of us would even think to pull out so uh and and i think that you guys will like uh the element that rich adds to the show rich also known as Razorcade. maybe we will uh catch some of that rational inquisition out of uh, rich when we call up a christian right now who has ducked us on the show twice listen in as the rational response squad takes on a theist with us on the line now is Travis. We met Travis on MySpace. He responded to an advertisement, basically, that we put out asking uh, if Christians wanted to come on the show and defend uh, belief in God. And uh, Travis has uh, very, um, very cool of himself to uh, decide to come on and uh, and do what most Christians uh, won't even take a stab at. So, uh, Travis, welcome aboard. Thanks for uh, coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let me introduce as well uh, my uh, co-host. Uh, with me, I have Rook Hawkins. How's it going? Hey, how you doing? I've got Mike, also known as Yellow Number Five. Hey, Travis. And, uh, and the, the Rational, Rational Inquisitor, Inquisitor. Razorcade. Hey. So, hey. <laughs> so, what church do you go to? What, what brand of Christianity do you uh, believe in? I go to a Southern Baptist church, uh, Hillcrest Baptist Church in Vallejo. Okay. Do you believe that there is a chance that there is no God? Mm, personally, no. Are you open to the possibility that there isn't a God? Well, it is possible. Yeah, there's, all things are possible. So, so I mean, so basically, you're sure there is a God? Yeah. And uh, is there any sort of evidence that could be universal to us as well as yourself that could convince us that that there is one you know, the bible in itself so if if the bible is uh is evidence of of god then are other books also evidence of themselves for example the flying spaghetti monster gospel is now available at barnes and noble does that prove that the flying spaghetti monster is is real <laughs> well with the bible we have certain um we have manuscripts and we don't have any of the original copies of the letters we have we have many like copies of them but we don't have the original but we do have over 5000 copies of the new books of the new testament and throughout the entire new testament that we have all of it there are 20000 um lines or something or something like that and out of all of that there's only 40 lines that are in question 
And it, none of those the questions are not in morality or in doctrine at all. Wait, wait, talking about there's yeah. You saying there's only forty lines of the Bible that are in question now? What what exactly? Uh, no, in the New Testament. In okay. the New Testament. But what exactly yeah. do you mean by in question here, as to the factual well, nature? It, of- it's not because like the Greek um, translation of words, they're so close that it could if just one change of the word, it could change a sentence, but. Either way, that sentence is changed. It doesn't affect morality or doctrine. Okay, but like I said, uh, what I'm getting at here is when you say in question, do you mean as to the the facts of what actually happened? Like, do you think that... They're just not sure it's translated right. Okay, but what I'm asking basically is how do you know what's in that book is true? Take, for example, Herod's Slaughter of the Innocents that was uh, basically around the time of Jesus' supposed birth. Do you actually think that that is depicting a real event? Well, how we'd be able to tell all this stuff is we do have like many copies of different things. Like if I wrote something down and wrote out a paragraph and I gave it to you and 10 of your friends and I had you guys like write that paragraph and I threw away the original copy I'm sure all of you would have a different, you'd have something different there, but we could bring all of them together and we could tell what's different and we could find out what the original uh, paragraph said. Mm-hmm. No, so I, we can do that now. I and agree. We I can agree. Tell. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a big game of telephone, but when you put all the pieces yeah. together, yeah, I understand what you're saying. You can take the common elements and see if you can get back to the original. But what I'm basically asking is, okay, Say this is what the original versions of it say. Like, let's let's just leave that out. Is what the Bible is actually talking about, not the subject matter, not the way it's written, but the actual subject matter in it is, are you saying that that's, you know, is, it's truth and factual real events? Yeah. Okay. And how do you know that? I mean, just because, proof. well, okay, proof, just because you have the original story, just because I have the original copy of Moby Dick doesn't mean that that story actually took place (laughs) yeah you see what i'm saying so well it goes like in it's archaeological too is there's a whole bunch of things that i could get more stuff if you'd like if you just i'm kind of confused i don't know i'm just what do you what what are you kind of confused about i don't know really (laughs) i'm just (laughs) kind of thrown right now yeah what we would like is obviously is is if I mean if we're going to believe in something, okay, we we need yeah. some sort of concrete proof. Uh, the types of proof that you've given are not wouldn't be suitable for us to, well, to yeah, believe in. I that. <laughs> and um, you know, I mean, feel free if you have some sort of archaeological proofs, you know, bring them to our attention, you know. Uh, but in in terms of the Bible, I mean, we we I think all would agree that the Bible proves itself to be inaccurate that you can find so many contradictions in the Bible uh, mm. that the the Bible itself uh, shows that it's just not possible when you read it and you read a book that contradicts itself you you must be able to determine okay well this book's fiction and maybe it's a good story but it's a fictional book and in fact I'm curious do you believe that the Bible is the inerrant perfect infallible word of God or do you believe that it was a work written by man and it has you know, plenty of contradictions in it. I personally haven't seen any contradictions in it myself. But what I know of, we haven't found any that contradict the Bible, but because we have the the authors like of the New Testament, we have the original. Let me ask you: If I could show you one contradiction, would that be enough to prove that that God is not possible? Not to me, no. If you read a story, okay, and I said to you, "Here's a true story." And on page one of the story, it said, John definitely knew how to jump up in the sky 20 feet high. And then on the second page of the story, it said, John was incapable of jumping even one foot off the ground. Would you look at that story and say, well, this story, that part isn't true, but maybe the rest is. Or would you look at it and say, well, this story is fiction and I kind of have to worry about what parts I take as 100% factual. Well, if you were to actually, if I read that, because he, you can know something, but not be able to do it. Well, what I'm saying is that in my example, John, you know, 
can jump 20 feet high on page one and he can't jump five feet off the ground on page two. It does nothing about him knowing how to jump. He, he knows how yeah. to jump. But what mm-hmm. I'm saying is when you read the story, you look at it and go, wait, this doesn't, this doesn't match up. You know, page one, he could jump 20 feet. How come he can only jump? He can't even jump five feet now. Um, you know, Rook is really good at, at biblical contradictions and I'll, I'll let him try to point out at least one to you and, and we'll see if that, you know, changes your, your view on the Bible at all. Well, mm-hmm. hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm the group's biblical expert and ancient text expert here. So let me let me give you another ex- analogy so uh, you can kind of understand this better. Um, you ever heard of a, like a witness at a car accident example? Like, um, say you're you're the cop and there was mm-hmm. a car accident. You're at the scene of the crime and you have two witnesses. And witness yeah. A says he saw the red car traveling in a southbound lane, heading at 40 miles an hour. And witness B said she saw uh, the red car heading in eastbound lane traveling at 100 miles an hour, okay? Uh, as an officer, which one would you believe? I wouldn't be able to tell. Exactly. And if you were even to double that, okay, let's say you had four witnesses to a scene of a crime, okay? And each of them had a different story, okay? One said they saw four passengers in a car. One said they saw two. One said they saw only one person driving a car. Another person said that they saw, uh, it looked like three, but it could have been four. Which one would you believe? I wouldn't be able to tell. Exactly. Now, this is what we have in the Gospels, okay? They're supposedly synoptic, but really they're not. Clearly, all three of them derive from some ancient source. But let me ask you this question here, okay? If I could tell you that in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, all three of them are totally inaccurate when it comes to what time the people came to the tomb, to Jesus' tomb, what would you tell me? I don't understand really. Sorry. Okay. Say say you're the witness to Jesus resurrecting from the tomb. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, would you be able to tell me what time of day Jesus was resurrected? Yeah, I probably would be able to tell you. Okay. Well, let's say you witnessed people coming to the tomb to see Jesus resurrected. You could be telling you could tell me what time they got there, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you admit that that you wouldn't be able to tell who was telling the truth or not when it comes to the car accident, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, someone or all of them are lying, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, if in Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, okay, all three accounts have Mary, well, first off, the amount of people who showed up at the tomb incorrect. One says it was just Mary. One says it was Mary and some women. And other people say it was Mary and uh, another person. Okay. All, all three accounts are different. Which one would you believe? I'd like to read that. I don't have a Bible with me right now. <laughs> if you give me a minute, I can give you the exact verses and you can, uh, I can read them to you. Okay. Okay. I, I hope you don't take my word for it. I hope you actually research this when you get home too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, actually, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, while we're on the topic, this is just something for our listeners and not, you know, not just for Travis, but you know, anything that we say on this show is, is, you know, we, we think we, we've got it right, but everybody should cross reference anything they hear on the show. They shouldn't blindly trust anything that they hear, whether it's from a pastor or from three guys or four guys claiming to be rational responders, you know, uh, look yeah. it up, look it up for yourself. And, uh, and that's really what, what, our kind of our motto is to the whole thing and that's why we don't blindly trust the, those who uh who do believe in 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 a god or would preach to us that that a god exists without universal evidence that we can all look at and say oh he, you know here oh there's a picture or uh you know oh yeah look scientific proof that over and over through testing that uh, this is verifiable you know but rook is looking up the passage right now so that he can give you um an exact quote uh, since you're not familiar with this one but back to what you were saying about you know still lending credence to the bible with with a contradiction at hand you have a contradiction in your hand and yet you would still have this belief in what you read in the book how can you justify that doesn't that sit odd to you that the infallible word of god would contradict itself i haven't seen any contradictions i've seen people like there's a group of people that they they're called a true church they're kind of scary at first but i got to talk to them they're really nice people though right but they had a bunch of stuff from the Bible that contradicts itself, but we went to look at it and we, I went, we threw it with myself. I went through it with other people and come find out that they were just taking things out of context. Okay. Instead of taking the whole scripture, they'd only take like half of it and yeah. then use that. And I think there's definitely some people out there that claim that they found a contradiction and, and, and there's some out of contextual things happening there. But, um, at the same time, I mean, I, 
I mean, we have just countless contradictions. Um, and when I say countless, I mean, literally, I mean, uh, just, yeah, I've you never can, seen contradictions. In you the can Bible. actually go to uh, the rational responders website and uh, go into biblical errancy form. That's the form that I run. And, uh, there's actually a compilation there. Uh, just a summary of some of them. There's, there's probably at least uh, 50 to a hundred I listed. But uh, let me continue looking for this here. Yeah, all, and all theists that are out there, whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, we'd love to have you on the show. If you want to come on the show and uh, and you know d- defend your God, I guess is the best way to put it. I mean, this is kind of discussion yeah. slash debate. Um, I think we're pretty easy going, although obviously uh, what we might say might be a bitter pill to swallow. Uh, you well, know, be nice about it. <laughs> co- yeah, come on the show and uh, and we'll, we'll you know we'll talk about it. I mean, we're lo- looking for a rational solution together, and you know, honestly. It would be nice if there's a God out there, and it's nice to think that there could be one, and and if there is one, I'd like to know it. But you know what? There's no proof. And by the way, if that God does exist, I would hope that also he's not all-powerful, because if he loves us and he's all-powerful, he's clearly fucked us, okay? Well, he's got a lot of explaining to he's do. He's got a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, Hurricane Katrina, okay, yes. would be just one teeny little you know example one moment in time that you can well, look at and and say you know what, what the fuck say, were you thinking you know what i could say on that is that well, god won't mess with free will the gift mm-hmm. he gave us is uh, freedom of choice our own free will well whose free will caused the hurricane well that was it's natural disaster god doesn't have any control on nature he can control it yeah but if he were to stop that it would mess with people's free will. Well, how would it mess with people's free will? He, the person who created the hurricane in the first place, did a human create that hurricane? He just said he didn't, no. he didn't believe that. He said it was a natural disaster. It's not, a natural disaster. Not, and what, and, disaster. And, 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 and your belief system, what rules over nature? In my belief system, well, God rules over all really. Yeah. But he won't, he's in control, but it, he didn't cause it to happen. How did he not co- who caused it to happen if he didn't cause it to happen? It was natural. It, it just And who happened. created nature? God. So, so who caused it to happen? He created, but he didn't cause it to happen. He just said he, he made, created nature. He created he made, all that is he nature. He made nature. He made nature and nature did it. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that your God is all knowing like the Bible says he is? Yeah. Okay. Then did God know at the moment, okay, when he created everything, okay, did he know that one day a Hurricane Katrina would decimate New Orleans, kill several thousand people? I'm sure, yeah. Okay. And is he powerful enough to stop that hurricane? Yes. Is he all loving? He is loving, yes. Okay. So do you not find that that's contradictory? He's loving but yet he had the power to stop something that he knew before he created you and I, before he even allowed you and I to come into existence. He knew ahead of time that a hurricane would decimate New Orleans and, and, and that whole coastal area and yet did nothing to stop it because of free will that makes no sense. We could all still have free will without that hurricane have come. Yeah, How would yeah. that have affected our free will? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a mere human and if I had the power, I would have stopped it. An example that I've always liked to use is if you knew that somebody was going to rob a bank and shoot the teller and you didn't do anything about it, you didn't tell the police, you did nothing at all to try to stop it or try to prevent it. Wouldn't our courts hold you responsible for doing nothing, for sitting on your hands and allowing that to happen? So at some point, you've got to say that God is, and, and is even culpable if, here. And even if the courts wouldn't have held you responsible, you'd still have to look at the person and say, well, that, that wasn't a very loving thing to do. You must not have the capacity to be able to reach a telephone. Okay. You must not yeah. physically be able to reach the telephone, therefore not being all powerful. But yeah, I think Rook's got back well, to the point. So well, no, 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 no. Just, just finish this just up. To, and, just to well. be sure here. I mean, you know, uh, do, do you understand this contradiction that we're talking about right now? That well, I could, I could get more on that if you'd like. Go ahead. Well, not like right How now, is it? but I could. <laughs> I don't well, well, this is just basic philosophy. You don't even need to yeah. read anything to be able to dis- discern what is right or wrong here. You know, this is just, you know, does it seem to be right? It doesn't seem to be. You want your feelings, basically. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't smell right. Yeah. I mean, you don't don't you don't need to go and and look up the the standard response to this, you know, just Yeah, exactly. The standard you, response is filled with bullshit. Right. We've heard those standard responses before and, you know, we can tear those to shreds at will. 
you know, we've done all the reading on this, you know, w- so they're not going to convince us, certainly. What may, in fact, convince us is something we've not heard before. That could be something that just comes, you know, off the cuff from you, you know, from your gut. You know, if you just give us your gut reaction to it, um, you'll be doing a lot more than professional apologists ever have. Do you, do you feel that God can, can be all three at the same time when looking at a natural disaster like Hurricane Katrina? He's all loving, he's all knowing, and he's all powerful. Mm-hmm. Okay, but yet he he created, okay, us knowing full well that a hurricane would come and kill three thousand of his children. How many died in Katrina? Was it about three two thousand? Well, yeah, like a, or an even bigger one. You look at the uh, Boxing Day tsunami. In uh, like I said, I mean, I yeah. only wanted to even touch yeah. one speck of time. I mean, you could look at every single day of humanity and and find hundreds <laughs> of thousands of examples around yeah. the earth where it's like, why didn't God care about me that time? break your leg. Maybe you have an important track meet the next day and you break your leg. I mean, where was God there? You know, but I just want to touch one speck of time and that's Hurricane Katrina. God knew before he created everything that that would, that that event would occur. And yet you say to us that he's loving. Mm -hmm. I just don't get it. It just, that to me isn't love. That's not something that I would ever, you know, if I knew that somebody was going to kill my son the next day, there's no way that I could allow that to happen. I no way. Yeah, I, I couldn't ever justify calling a parent who allows her child to drown and does nothing loving. Yeah. I mean, if that's love, that's yeah. exactly what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we are all fucked. I mean, you might that's, as well pull the trigger yourself. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, you might as well have just been holding the bag over some kid's head and just suffocating them to death if, if, if you're not going to do anything. I mean, that's why our cult, our courts hold those people accountable because it's- Did you say our cult? <laughs> <Dick. Yeah. laughs> uh, but anyway yeah did you want to end up it's sad that you know, i think you're right on the tip of this and you see it you but you don't want to admit it right it's and it's it that's frustrating well what because- if it was his mother what if his mother was in trouble if she was like in a hurricane and he had the power to to save her would he do it if I had the power to, yeah. yes. God is all powerful though why couldn't god create yeah. nature without having natural disasters in it to begin with and yet we would still have free will. Why couldn't God do that? Yeah. Why, why isn't he that powerful to do something like that? I'm, I believe he has the power to do that. But I, I can't say personally why he doesn't. I don't really want to say the wrong thing. I, don't, I could say there personally. No, I don't know. There is no wrong thing. I don't know a lot, a lot about it. But Well, like I said, like there's, there's no wrong answer. Um, you know. Uh, Christianity isn't going to rise or fall by your answers. That well, yeah. Here. <laughs> within, it within it, I do have <laughs> doubts. We all have doubts. And it, that's when faith has to come in. Oh, okay. So faith, of course, is now now not only belief without any evidence, but belief in spite of the evidence. Right. Oh, no, no, no. It's belief within evidence. Within evidence, Where Belie- the- belief without evidence would be a blind faith. I don't. I wouldn't want to live with blind faith. Well, well, what I, e- what what uh, scientific evidence is there to prove that God exists? Well, there's many things, really. If you want to, all right. Well, how about just one? One, one. like the resurrection of Jesus. No, that doesn't prove God. That's, That's a story. The fatal format. The fatal format. What's that? I forgot. Oh, man, that sucks. <laughs> well, I want to hear more about this resurrection of Jesus being No, 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 no. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's a scientific the, the, the oh, performance that he actually went through it. I mean, there's not even scientific proof that, that, that the resurrection, exists. yeah, that Jesus ever even existed. There's not even evidence of that. So, so what, I'm, I'm kind of curious where you're drawing your, your, that he went through it. Where's your scientific evidence that he even went through it? We found many scriptures, uh, not scriptures, we found like the, all the old scrolls and all that stuff. How old do you think they and are? We've also found the flying spaghetti monster at Barnes & Noble. Well, no, how old do you think those, yeah. scrolls, how old do you think those scrolls are? I can't say it myself. Well, well I can. Wouldn't you think that, the, <laughs> you would think that those scrolls would be uh, from the time period when Jesus was said to ex- have existed, right? That's, that's what you're saying, right? That, you, that they're contemporary accounts? That somebody saw Jesus being, you know, resurrected. They went back home. They wrote it down on a piece of paper. And we now have that proof. Rolled it up, stuck it in a pot. And that's, that's, later. That would be suitable <laughs> evidence. Would, would you not agree? That, that would be good evidence for you. Um, well, I can't really say. When do you think the most early information that we have about Jesus Christ came from? It was in the Old Testament. Okay. And when do you think that was compiled? 
I'm sorry, in the Old Testament. He said Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, didn't even catch it there. That was a little blemish on your part. Uh, The Old Testament predates Jesus Christ by several thousand years. You You mean the New Testament, right? I know they're really old. That's all I I can say that. I know they're really old. How about I give you a date? Well, you would expect the date to be similar to when Jesus had existed. Okay. New well, Testament was, was compiled 316. It was it was compiled by Arrhenius, yeah. Um, in 300 and about 285 well, no, years after published. Jesus that died. That's when it was published. Okay. Uh, the earliest the earliest fragment we have, okay, the very earliest is a fragment from the Gospel of John. It's called it's called the uh, the P52 fragment and it's from 150 CE. That's over 100 years after they say Jesus lived. 100 that's 120 years right there. Okay, of space. There is not one fragment that we have any earlier than that. And it's only that one. Every other fragment, every other manuscript that you mentioned earlier, the thousands of manuscripts that you mentioned, most of them, about 98%, are from modern time. That's that's contemporary area, our contemporary area, from, from 1940 and up. That, those are the manuscripts that we have. Every other manuscript before that, the other 2%, takes place from the time of the Bible's um, publishing, which is around you know the three the three hundreds, okay, up until nineteen forty, it's two percent. That's all it is. Travis, our our biggest you mm-hmm. know f- thing here is that if you're going to believe something based your whole life around it, you probably should know the history of it. Yeah, I mean, because it really puts it into perspective. It's you, you say to yourself, "Wait a sec." I mean, you got to understand, uh, all four guys that you're talking to. We're believers, mm-hmm. okay? You've got a you've got an altar boy here, okay? A guy who was studying to be a priest, a uh, born again Christian, and a Catholic, all in the room with you, okay? All right, mm-hmm. so we 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 were all believers, and we all looked at the evidence and said to ourselves, like, this doesn't it just doesn't make sense. And uh, you know, as you put real pieces of the puzzle together, actual history, you start to say to yourself, it just it just doesn't fit. And uh, instead of blindly trusting those who uh, spouted off information to us, people who you know begged for money. Um, you know, we've decided to, you know, investigate the claims and they just don't fit. And we think that after this conversation is done, hopefully you and any other Christian listeners that are out there will go and investigate some, some of this for yourself and not just blindly trust us either. It seems to me that you want to go run to your, your preacher or someone along those lines and ask them, what, what is the proper response here? And he's going to give you a contrived uh, response that we've heard before. They don't have substance. You know, it's, they call it apologetics for a reason. They're basically apologizing for the shortcomings of the manuscripts, apologizing for the shortcomings of God. That's a good point. But what you really need to do is make up your own mind. Don't take what we tell you on faith and certainly don't take what your preacher tells you on faith either. Think about these things and think through them on your own. So yeah, and here's actually something to start you off on here. Uh, I, I found the passages for you. I'm going to read them for well, you. This okay? is yeah for the listener. This is oh, what yeah. we were talking about earlier <laughs> about, about about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> the different Mary accounts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now all these uh, that I'm reading you from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and there actually is one from John too. So um, it says here in Matthew 28:1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Okay. Um, there's only two Marys, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. In Mark 16, 1, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now that's more than two, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Luke twenty four ten says it was Mary Magdalene, Joanne, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Now that doesn't make any sense. That's a totally different number. In in Matt we have two, and in Mark we have two Marys and Salome, which is three, right? And then mm-hmm. in Luke twenty four ten, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanne, and Mary, the mother of James, and another woman. So that's four. And it doesn't even have Salome. It has Joanna. Okay, so it's Joanna and Salome, two different people, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, now, in John 21, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, just Mary, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and she seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And that's only Mary herself and John. Mm-hmm. So, all four of these accounts contradict each other. All four of them do. And not only do they contradict each other with how many people came, but on the first one, it says, at the end of the Sabbath, okay, at the end of the Sabbath, when it was just beginning to dawn, for the first day of the week, okay? And in Mark, it says when the Sabbath had passed, that means 
it wasn't at the end of it. It was it was already gone. It was probably early morning. It was early morning in Mark. Okay. It wasn't it wasn't before dawn. It was early morning. Okay. It's two different times. Okay. Oh, also in, in Mark, they brought spices that shows that they were bringing gifts. Okay. And the other council says that. So it's just striking to me that here's one contradiction for you to look at. Okay. And with all four mm-hmm. books, neither one of them agree on with any of the other one on how many people came to this, what time they came and what they brought with them. I can't say from knowing that I can explain that, but I, what I would think myself was that the guys that wrote it, the guys weren't even there. Of course not. Because the girls had to come and tell them about it. And in that time, girls, you know, they're just kind of pushed to the side. Like, Be quiet, woman. Nobody wants to hear you. You know, so they really didn't really believe the girls that much then. And but, better yet, what would you think about if that story was actually written like a hundred years after it happened? <laughs> like three generations of lives passed. The average lifespan was 48. That was the oldest. Do you remember playing Whisper Down the Lane in school? Yeah, telephone. Yeah. Do, do you remember playing yeah. Whisper Down the Lane? And, and you, had yeah. like eight, you had like eight people about a two-minute stretch, and the story was different by the time it got to the end of eight people in a two-minute stretch? Yeah. How do you think a story might change? After three generations, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, nine <laughs> generations of people telling a story over and over and over again. It's going to change. I know that. Right. The point is, is, you know, you have all these stories then. And even if you can take it back to, uh, you know, a common story, you still have no basis for the actual facts in that story. Like Rook said, you know, four or five different witnesses telling you totally different things. At some point, you know, you either... You have, have to be the, the cop. Exactly. You have to be the cop and say, yeah. look, one of you or all of you are lying. And now how do you decide that? Where is the evidence that tells you, well, at least with a cop, you can you can look at the evidence. You can be scientific. You can, you can you go can actually to the actual the car scene of the accident. Right. You can go to the scene of the crime. You obviously have the car in front of you and you can obviously see how many passengers were there. And on top of that, you can also use a scientific method and, uh, you know, forensics to decide what actually happened. We're looking at a book now, the earliest book in the, in the Gospels, the four Gospels, is Mark. And that was written after the destruction of the temple, at least at the very earliest. Con- the most conservative account that they can give for the writing of Mark is at 75 CE. Okay, that's common era. 75 AD, and it, you probably know it as, okay? That still, okay, that's almost 40 years after the death of Jesus, okay? His... There was no eyewitness accounts, no contemporary accounts written in the lifetime of Jesus that gives us any information as to which one of these accounts is accurate. So I pose a question to you again. Which one of these would you believe? I can't tell. I really... Well, actually, he, oh. if he believes the Bible, he believes all of them are true, even, is, though, even though that's well, completely all the, impossible. All the stories, um... Even though that's completely impossible, he believes that all of them are true. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is this is exactly why... I think all four of us here agreed that we can no longer follow the Bible because of instances like this. One of the reasons. Right. Well, one of the many. Again, I can find something on every page. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and Travis, um, they're just asking you to look into it a little better. Oh, I am. Not, I not just, look not just go with your feelings, but really investigate it like the cop. Like, delve into it. Seriously. Find out. I want to. Well, Travis, it's it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you on the phone, and uh, thanks for uh, remaining polite and civil with us. I hope that uh, you feel we've afforded you the uh, same luxury, and uh, hopefully, you, you will uh, you know research a little bit more, and uh, you know feel free to come on the show in the future, or even better yet, you know if you do go to a, a minister, a preacher, an expert, you know, and you you, you want to try to get some answers, feel free to tell them to come on the show instead of you bringing back what they told you we'd rather just talk to them directly i mean l- let us debunk them to their face instead of secondhand and uh, in fact you can actually see whether or not they have the guts for what they would preach to you as in a, a way to live as a whole lifestyle as a way that you should base your life and you can see whether or not they have the uh the the evidence or the guts to come on our show and and do this you can tell them we're not you know, going to yell at them, scream at them. We haven't been rude. And, uh, and, and let's see what they have, you know? I might, I might just give the number to my pastor then, you know? <laughs> sure. But I am going to look in this on myself. I'd like to thank you guys, really. That's all we ask. And thank you, man. Can I say one thing to you uh, from the heart? Seriously? Mm-hmm. Uh, after you do go and investigate all this stuff and read all these stories, and uh, you come to the conclusion that, hey, it doesn't make sense, 
Uh, like, don't be scared. Seriously. Like, we're all yeah. we're all here for you. We're all part of the human race. We're all here to help each other, right? Yeah, I mean, not that you'll definitely come to that conclusion. <laughs> we obviously feel that that's the logical and rational conclusion. But, you know, without a God, uh, the fact is, uh, you know, we've all still gotten this far. Uh, if, if God doesn't exist and God has never played any role in your life, you still manage to get to today on this phone call with us. You're alive. You're kicking. You know, so, you know, if there is no God, you obviously you don't need him to get through. So, yeah, I mean, if 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 that is a natural response for people who say, you know, oh, my God, they're. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, there's no god. Oh my god, god. my god, there's no god. <laughs> and you know what? We're not saying that proving that the Bible is is a load of horse crap is says there's no god. It it merely says that that particular god does not exist. So, um I do believe there is a god though. I mean, we, we know fine. you do. Well, yeah, yeah, there has to be something. I don't think this world came by chance. Well, we could deal with that in phone call number two if hey, you want. Right. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 the the subject. I'm the science geek here, and uh, let me tell you, I don't believe the world got here by chance either. Yeah. And God wasn't involved. So, uh, yeah, but that's, another that's, that's another topic. That's yeah. Big topic. Yeah, that's big. <laughs> that can go on to another call. <laughs> it's cosmic. But, uh, <laughs> so anyway, man, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to maybe hearing from you in the future. And in fact, if you want to jump on our message boards, rationalresponders.com, you know, feel free to come into our atheist versus theist forum. Um, yeah, point out to me who you are and I'll make sure that, uh, that, you know, you get treated kindly there. So, all right, man. Okay. All right, All right. Thanks a lot, buddy. Take care. Take Have care. a good one, man. Bye. Right, bye. Bye. I'm glad Travis came on and finally got him on the show. Uh, yeah. We should actually mention right now that we get occasionally, I see somebody make a negative comment about the type of guests that we've had on our show. And they've said stuff like, you know, oh, well, you guys aren't bringing on, you know, like important, you know, pastors or people who can really defend their faith very well. And I mean, nobody can defend Christianity very well. Yeah. Um, you know, they all have an invite. I mean, seriously, if you can get a, a Lee Strobel on or a famous author on, I mean, have them come on. We, we, we have God. We have a promotion <laughs> for God to come on our show. I mean, yeah. who can defend God it's, better than himself? First of all, I mean, it's, it's, not for us, it's not for our lack of asking on our part that these people haven't appeared in our show. You know, we have had people like Ray Comfort on our show. And yeah. We've got an open invitation to pretty much any and every theist out there. You know, all um, they have to do is send an email to rationalresponsequad at hotmail.com. You can send suggestions to rationalresponsequad at hotmail.com, or you can post them in our uh, show guests and uh, musicians forum uh, at rationalresponders.com. So, but, you know, it, you know, back on the issue of people saying that we don't bring on a high, you know, level of Christian guest, uh, I don't think that that necessarily is important. We are dealing with a world in which we have many believers and they run all different gamuts of intellectual understanding of the Bible and, and their own faith. And uh, the majority of believers are like pe tr people like Travis. You know, the We're majority like of us. believers are not pastors and ministers and people who study the Bible all day long. Yet these people still believe in the Bible. Travis still believes that what he reads in the Bible and that his God is correct. And you don't need to talk to a pastor to affect people like Travis. I think we had a great dialogue with Travis today and, and hopefully, you know, he will do some of the things he said and go learn and maybe we'll see him around the forums. Right. And, you know, like, like I was saying earlier, you get a professional apologist and you get a canned response. Um, you're going to hear the same stuff over and over and over again. The everyday Christians that we talk to, maybe you'll actually hear some original arguments no, and some original ideas. Brian. Or in the apologists, you know, you, you, uh, you not only do you get a canned response, but you also, I think, get less of a willingness to have an open mind. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I think with somebody like Travis, even though he did basically admit he had a closed mind, you know, in agreeing that, you know, if you could show me contradictions in the Bible, I would still believe it. That type of philosophy doesn't make sense. Or saying, you know, he knows for sure that a God does exist. I mean, those are closed minded beliefs. I mean, in order for one, and this is a famous infidel God quote, but in order for one to be open minded, they must accept the possibility that they may be wrong. Yep. Uh, you know, before we get out of here, I want to play a little segment that I recorded yesterday because meme couldn't be here today. I have a little uh, artist highlight of the day, the artist spotlight, and we'll have a song in a moment called uh, Original, Sin, uh, uh, Original Sin, another hip hop song that's uh, pretty cool and actually right on topic really with what we're talking about today. So like I said, here is a segment that I recorded yesterday and uh, 
Thanks so much for joining us again on another episode of the Rational Response Squad. Stay rational, folks. Hey, this is Eric Schwartz, writer, author, performer of Keep Your Jesus Off My Penis, and you are smart enough to be listening to the Rational Response Squad. The Rational Response Squad is your voice of rational thought online. Please subscribe today at www.rationalresponders.com for access to all of their shows. With us on the line now is Meme, a uh, member at the Infidel Guy message boards and a friend of freethoughtmedia.com and, and now a friend of uh, the Rational Response Squad. He's put together a little song called Original Sin, and it's nice to have you on the line with us, man. How you doing? Uh, very well, thanks. Um, nice to talk to you, Brian. You said this song, uh, Original Sin, was originally created for a uh, blog carnival uh, called God or Not. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. A few months ago, um, I was regularly podcasting on hiphopbullshit.com and basically creating a, a song every every week or every month. It was pretty irregular. And a blog carnival came up called God or Not. And what they were trying to do was get um, atheists and Christians talking to each other and, uh, you know, get a dialogue going about uh, different topics that relate to those subjects. And, you know, I thought I'd contribute to help promote my podcast. Where can people find your podcast? Um, I've actually taken it off right now. Um, the uh, URL, um, Hip Hop Bullshit, will still be working, so they can use that. So it's hiphopbullshit.com? Right, exactly, yeah. Okay. The topic of that month was um, Original Sin. They had a bunch of different topics, and I contributed a few songs. But for this one, the topic was Original Sin, and... Basically, you know, uh, people spoke about all different kinds of issues related to that. Um, and uh, mine was um, just kind of picking it apart and saying, you know, it's kind of a stupid idea. And uh, a lot of people said nice things about it. And other people said um, it made them think. And then uh, I actually got into a conversation for a long while with um, a pastor. He said eventually all the Christians ran away from this whole site. The, the whole uh, carnival started with the evangelical atheist. He has a blog. They they pulled in a bunch of Christians and a bun- bunch of atheists who have their own blogs and podcasts and stuff like that. And there was this dialogue going for a while. And I think maybe it ran for three, four months. And it was getting loads of contributions. And the posts were really interesting. And then after a while, it's just all the Christians just started to die off from the site. And um, they stopped posting. After a while, they were only receiving contributions from uh, atheist um I, I don't know how you want to take that um, result, but it suggests to me that we won the argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <They'd probably disagree. laughs> yeah. Why don't you introduce the song for us and lead us out of here? Okay, cool. The song is Original Sin. It's by me. It's maybe three, four months old. I uh, hope you like it. What a topic. Original Sin is the topic for those who tuned in. By this point in the debate, I'm already tuned out. First, let's define what the topic's about. Basically, God wants us to follow his route. Exactly. He gives us free will, and he wants us to use it. Then lose it when we do, of course, it's Stop useless. Disobeying. The only way to redeem ourselves is through blood. But what's good is Jesus already spilled it for us. Thanks, Jesus. So in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam and his leaf. And made him a man called Eve so he could use what's underneath. He created all sophisticated machinery called people. I fucked it all up when he created evil. The tree of knowledge or forbidden fruit. And Eve was seduced by its tasty juice. The talking snake betrayed God's secrets. And was forever made to slither on his belly beneath us. As opposed to flying, to which it was accustomed. He was pissed, but it seems he had free will, and not just us. Anyway, God knows all, no dice involved. So he made us this way, and we didn't evolve. Uh-uh. As anyone will tell you, we react to stimuli, and God knows how we will react, and why. He knows everything. Since the Garden of Eden was made entirely by God, surely the way we reacted was entirely his fault. Makes sense. Well, if you believe we behave as we do because of our brains, then you must believe this argument the way I just said. Yep. But if you believe in dualism and souls, Ooh. I suppose that the argument doesn't quite so naturally flow. If we really are completely free to make choices, then our actions are guided by our own voices. Do this. But who made those voices? Was it God or man? God. Please decide now and try to be consistent. Because if you say God, then you can see my point earlier. But if I say man, then I'm about to take some rights from you. Uh oh. Next time you do another good deed, please reflect hmm. on the two options I gave you in this argument. If you credit God for only the good and never the bad or vice versa, Always you're making a very, very severe observational error. Now I know some of you will not care whether I'm right. 
In the end you say, you feel in your heart there's a I light. I just know it. And it's God, and you know it in your core, and that's what matters. Yep. But I'm afraid this must be where our discourse shatters. Like a stone tablet. Because your faith precludes rational examination, and you keep yourself cocooned because it makes you feel safer. Ah. If I may, though, it seems to me to be selfish mm-hmm. to believe something just because it improves yep. your subjective experience when it doesn't help technology, science, or medicine. So to me, you could say faith is the original sin. Mmm, ironic. Hiphopbullshit.com Hiphopbullshit.com Hiphopbullshit.com